In this video, I'm gonna share with you my two-step church announcement formula that you can use in your live announcements from stage or in your pre-recorded video announcements. Well, hey there, my name is Brady Shearer. I'm the CEO of Pro Church Tools, and in the last five years alone, I've presented more than 30,000 announcements for churches. Wait, 30,000 announcements? That can't be right. I get it, I'd be skeptical too, but that number is correct. You see, every single week I record video announcements for about 25 different churches from around the globe. Each church averages about five individual announcements each week. There are 52 weeks in a year, and I've been doing this for more than five years now. So. There's the math. But with that being said, I'll admit it. Church announcements is an unusual skill to have so much experience with. But this is great news for you because in this video, I'm going to take everything that I've learned from presenting church announcements and share it with you in my two-step church announcement formula. And it gets better because whether you're a bigger church or smaller church, this announcement formula will work for you. I've done announcements for every size of church, urban and rural, old and new with different traditions and theological emphases and all types of different ethnicities as well. One church even tried to get me to speak Spanish once, but that didn't work out so well. The point is this, the church announcement formula I'm about to share with you will work in any church in any context. How can I be so sure? Well, because this announcement formula uses the most powerful form of human communication as its foundation. Storytelling. Storytelling is the single most powerful form of human communication. And I know that's a pretty big claim, so let me offer you some proof to back it up. Let's start with Jesus himself. In Robert Stein's book, The Method and Message of Jesus' Teachings, he takes inventory of all of Jesus' teachings throughout the Synoptic Gospels and finds that no less than 35% of the time that Jesus was teaching, he was using story. More than one third of all of Jesus' teachings was communicated using story. And that's because I think Jesus understood the secret of storytelling that we now understand thanks to brain science. What is that secret? Well, storytelling is the only type of communication that actually forces our brains to focus and pay attention. Up to a third of our waking hours are spent in a daydreaming state. We're thinking about what's for dinner or about that movie we want to see. But storytelling is unique because it's the only type of communication that can snap us out of this daydreaming state and force our brains to focus. And I cannot overstate how important this is because one thing I like to say a lot is that attention is the most valuable commodity your church can possess. You and I, as church leaders, like to think that we're sharing the greatest story of all time, redemption through Jesus. And I agree with that. But if no one is paying attention to what we have to say, it doesn't matter if we're peddling eternity in paradise or a discounted oil change. If no one's paying attention, no one gets to hear the message to begin with, whatever that message may be. And this applies directly to church announcements as well. The goal of a church announcement is to compel someone to take a next step, to inspire action. You want a person to respond to your announcement and sign up for a small group, sign up to be baptized, set up recurring giving, register for an upcoming event. Of course, to inspire any of these next steps, you first need your church's attention. And the absolute best way to capture that attention, using both the example of Jesus and our current understanding of how the human brain works is storytelling. Now, at this point, you might be wondering, okay, Brady, but when do we actually get to learn the formula? And I hear you, so let's get to that. The two-step church announcement formula goes as follow. One story plus one next step. Crazy simple. Start with a story, follow it up with a next step. Now, we're gonna get to that single next step, part two in our two-part formula in just a moment, but first, I wanna show you some actual examples of how the first step in our formula, the story part, could actually work in real life. So in this first example you're about to see, I'm doing an announcement at my church for baptisms. My church had a baptism service coming up and we wanted as many people to participate as possible, and so we did an announcement for it. But rather than spend the bulk of my announcement time talking about the date and time and requirements, I simply told the story of when I was baptized. Here's what that looks like. All right, so baptism. It's uh, one of the most important moments in the life of every follower of Christ. And, you know, it's something that almost every church celebrates in one way or another. Uh, when I was a kid, I went to uh, this really small church out in the country, just about 30 people. Uh, you know, we did church pretty differently then. Uh, worship was just one acoustic guitar, and then we would all sing along. Uh, we used overhead projectors. Who remembers the overhead projector? Somebody, right? You know, the, the, the chorus is coming, so you got to take the sheet off, put the other sheet on. It's a whole big thing. Uh, and we did baptism there, and the way that we did it is that, that one part of the baptism was that if you were being baptized, you had to go up and in front of the church explain why you were doing it, why it was important to you. So I got baptized around the age of 10, and the idea of going in front of the church and proclaiming something like that was a pretty terrifying possibility. And so to prepare myself... I got a sheet of paper, and I wrote down what I was going to say, right? I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do, and I'm just going to read it, 
and I'm going to memorize it easy. So I get up to this, you know, old rickety pulpit in a really small chapel, and my, I can barely see over the top. I'm so short. That hasn't changed really, but, you know, I can barely see over the top. And I, I start reading, and I'm like, you know, like, I've decided to give my life to Jesus. It sounds cute, right? No, it was horrifying, I can assure you, as a kid. And so I, I vowed then and there. I said, you know what? I'm going to get this moment over with, but I vow to never serve in a church where I have the responsibility of talking live from a stage to a large group of people. <laughs> I did not succeed. Anyway, you know, so well, that's, that's, that's my baptism experience. We're not going to do things entirely like that here at Central for this baptism experience. You don't have to come up in front of everyone and share, you know, your reason for doing it, but it doesn't make it any less celebratory. You know, that moment when I was 10, I still remember that distinctly. My family was there. It was this amazing moment in my journey with Jesus. Okay, so that's an example of what the first step in our announcement formula looks like in a real live announcement. And at its core, this is all about information versus inspiration. Remember, the goal of a church announcement is to to inspire action, to compel someone in your church to take a next step. And it's so much easier to compel someone to take a next step by inspiring them through story than it is by piling on information. When it comes to information versus inspiration, inspiration is a far better motivator than information is. And with that being said, I want to show you another real live example of how to use story in your church announcements because there are multiple ways that you can actually accomplish this. In the first example, you saw me alone on stage telling a personal story about my own baptism experience. But what if you don't want to tell a personal story? Well, another way that you can use story to inspire next steps in your church is through a live interview on stage. Rather than share a personal story, leverage the story of another. And in this example, you're about to see my church was trying to recruit more volunteers for kids ministry, a universal struggle. So we decided to do an announcement for it. But again, rather than spout off a bunch of boring information from stage that would have compelled very few people, if any, to take a next step and volunteer, I hosted a live mini interview with a pair of real volunteers from our kids ministry to hear their story, and here's what that looks like. This time, I want to invite out a couple of my friends, Tim and Shannon. Uh, Tim and Shannon serve in the Central Kids Ministry. Uh, they started serving in Aussie Land in fall of 2017, and so we wanted to give them a couple of moments to share a little bit of their experience and their story. Thanks for being here, both of you. Uh, let's start with you, Shannon. Uh, like I said, you started serving fall 2017, so can you talk a little bit about the inspiration, why you got started in the first place? Absolutely. Thanks so much for having us here this morning, Brady. Um, Tim and I have been attending Central for just over five years now, and we really felt God calling us to be more involved with Central. So we began our journey through Next Steps, which was really helpful for us because it gave us some guidance in where exactly the church we wanted to serve. Uh, Tim and I were very fortunate at a young age to be able to grow up in a church with volunteers and leaders and teachers who dedicated their time to teaching us Bible stories and to talking with us about God. And for that reason, we were able to develop a relationship with God at such a young age. So Tim and I wanted to turn full circle with that and be those leaders and help to be a beacon of life for these kids so that they can um, experience the same thing. So that's why Central Kids was such a good fit for us. That's awesome. And, and Tim, for you, it's been about six months now serving in Central Kids. Can you talk about maybe some of the highlights of that experience thus far? Yeah, I would say one of the most exciting things that we've experienced is just seeing the change that happens in kids. Uh, you may see a new face there, and they're not a bit hesitant with the actions, with the songs, the worship songs, or not necessarily playing with the other kids, but as time goes on and weeks go by, you start noticing a change. You start almost see like a spark get ignited in them, and I believe it's God working in them. And it's incredible to witness, and I'm very thankful that Central Kids has provided that atmosphere for those changes to happen. So very, very exciting. That's awesome. It might not come as a surprise to you, but it takes an army of volunteers to do what we do week in and week out with Central Kids. And we couldn't do it without the help of great folks like Tim and Shannon. And so, if so there you have it. Another example of using story as the driving force in a church announcement. Now, at this point, you might be wondering, Brady, do you follow this formula every single time you do an announcement? Because you may have noticed that this type of announcement, when it is driven by story, is generally longer than your average church announcement. And that's because telling a story will almost always take more time than spitting out informational details on time, cost, location, and date. And so this may require a bit of a paradigm shift for you and your church. Here's the bottom line. At my church each week, we only have one, two, or at most, 
three different announcements that we share from stage. So I'm not getting up there and reading through the entire bulletin. And despite being a larger church with dozens of events and ministries happening all the time, we purposefully limit the number of announcements that we share from stage on a Sunday. Why do we do this? Well, because like I said earlier, we recognize that attention is the most valuable commodity we as a church can possess, but that commodity is finite and we want to steward it because it's a valuable resource. Think about it this way. Every time you add an additional announcement in service, you're asking people to pay attention to that announcement. And the more announcements you have, the more your congregation's attention is spread thin across multiple promotions. Now, if you're having difficulty deciding what deserves an announcement on a Sunday and what doesn't, one principle you could put into action is the 50% rule. The 50% rule is simple. If an announcement does not apply to 50% of the people in attendance on a Sunday morning, it does not warrant a stage announcement. Think about the two example announcements I've already shared with you, baptisms and the recruiting of kids volunteers. Both of those directly apply to more than 50% of the people in the pews generally. Ignore the 50% rule at your own peril because Consider this, if every week you're sharing a number of different announcements in service that don't apply to the majority of the congregation, you're actually conditioning your church to ignore your announcements because so many of them don't actually apply to the people listening. So no wonder people aren't taking next steps. No wonder people aren't taking action. You've conditioned them to not pay attention because too many announcements you share aren't applicable to them in the first place. Simply put, to maximize the impact of this church announcement formula, limit the number of Sunday announcements you have each week. And feel free to use the 50% rule if you're having trouble doing that. The final thing I'll say about this is that not all announcements are made equal. And even if you do limit your church's Sunday announcements to three or fewer, that doesn't mean you need to use this particular formula for every single announcement every single time. For example, let's say you had two different announcements you needed to share on a Sunday, and one was more important than the other. And let's say you only had about six minutes to get through both of these announcements. Well, don't feel obligated to spend an equal three minutes on each. Use this formula on the most important announcement, spending four or five minutes telling the story and making that call to action, and then quickly breeze through the less important announcement. This is something I do all the time. Just because I have two or three announcements to share on a Sunday, doesn't mean I'll use this formula for all of them. I'll only use the two-step church announcement formula on the most important one or two announcements each week, and then spend less time on the less important announcements. Okay, so we're through step one of the two-step church announcement formula. That first step is all about story, inspiration, not information. But equally important to the success of your church's announcements is the second step in the formula. If you remember, the two-step formula goes as follows. One story plus one next step. Start with a story, follow it up with a next step. And I cannot emphasize how important this second part of the formula truly is. Very few churches execute this part well but it truly does make all the difference. Part two of the announcement formula, one next step. Why does this matter? It matters because the reason we do announcements each week, the entire goal is to inspire our congregation to take a next step. Think about it this way. Every single church mission statement can be distilled down to two things, the great commission and or the greatest commandments. Every single church that follows the teachings of Jesus is trying to fulfill the same mission. We may phrase it differently, but at its core, everything you and I do within our churches is to help people to love God, love others, and make disciples. That's what we do. And what I need you to notice about each of these three statements, love God, love others, make disciples, is that each begins with a verb, love, love, and make. And to go back to third grade English, a verb is an action word. You can't love God passively. You can't love others passively. You cannot make disciples passively. Each of these objectives requires action. And I don't know about you, but I don't want a passive church full of spectators. I want an action-taking church full of active participants. Why? Well, because that truly is the only way to accomplish our church's mission. Every single thing we do as a church is rooted in this singular idea next steps. And this is why the second part of our formula is so important. Heck, this part of the formula is everything. Sure, you can tell a great story, you can inspire your congregation, maybe you even get their attention, but if you can't then parlay that attention into an actual next step, if you can't compel them to take action, then your announcement has failed to reach its goal. Want to know the best part though? Seeing an increase in the number of next steps in your church doesn't have to be difficult. And to show you how this can be done, I want to share the exact word-for-word -word script that I like to use at the end of every single one of my announcements. This is the precise script I use for part two of our church announcement formula when I want a church to take their next step, and it goes as follows. Head to lifeabundant.info or visit the lifeabundant.info kiosk in the lobby. That's the script. What makes this particular script so powerful? Well, firstly, this is the only script I ever use. 
I never ask people to talk to Pastor Carl. I never tell people to call the office. I never ask people to check the bulletin and I don't tell them to download an app. I never ask people to email the ministry leader, but this is what most churches do, right? Most churches actually sabotage their communications by making them chaotic. What do I mean by that? I mean that instead of offering their church one next step, like the script I just shared with you, most churches will communicate and complicate things by offering multiple next steps. And they'll further complicate things by using different next steps for different announcements. Here are a couple of examples. Check the bulletin, call the church, talk to the pastor, use the paper signups, email a ministry leader, download the app, among others. This is confusing. What's so powerful about the next step script that I just shared with you is that because it's the only one you need, every time you use it, it becomes more ingrained into the minds of your congregation. So the family sitting in the pew doesn't have to try to remember what number they need to call or who they need to email because every single next step for every single person in your church is identical. Head to lifeabundant.info or visit the lifeabundant.info kiosk in the lobby. It gets better though, because let's stop for a second now and take a closer look at this script. The first thing I want you to notice is that we're using a website for our one next step, lifeabundant.info. And the reason we use a website is because we want our church to be able to take next steps 24 seven. There are 168 hours every week. The church only takes up about one of those hours. That means you've got 167 other hours beyond your service and we wanna take advantage of those. So that's why we use a website for our next steps destination. I want my church to sign up for a small group on Sunday after service, of course, but I also want them to do that same thing in their break room at work on a Tuesday afternoon. If you're curious, the lifeabundant.info website was built using Nucleus and Nucleus is a new kind of website builder for churches because it was created around this idea idea of next steps. It's not just a digital version of a yellow pages listing. It's about next steps, capturing that info and then distributing it where it needs to go. We call this type of website a central hub. Of course, you can use any website you want, but if you head to nucleus.church, you can get a 30 day free trial of Nucleus with no credit card required to see if it might be a good fit for you. Head to www.nucleus.church and you can sign up for free. Now, there's one final part to this next step script that we haven't talked about. One more time, that script is head to lifeabundant.info or visit the lifeabundant.info kiosk in the lobby. Now, obviously you would substitute in your own URL there, but think about this for a moment. Using the two-part church announcement formula, you could be sharing a promotion about baptism. You could use story to grab your church's attention and compel them to take their next step. And because you're using a website, we like to call it your central hub, to capture all of your next steps, a person in your church could pull out their phone in the middle of service, sign up to be baptized right then and there. This is powerful stuff. With that being said, what about the people in your church that are less familiar with technology? Maybe they're a bit older and you don't want them to feel left out. Well, that's where the lifeabundant.info kiosk comes into play. The way this works is by using tablets set up in your lobby, you can configure an actual next steps kiosk using your exact same central hub website. In our case, that's lifeabundant.info. So we created the lifeabundant.info kiosk. So why is this so powerful? Well, for two reasons. Number one, by setting up a next steps kiosk and placing a volunteer there, you can make sure that anyone who's less familiar familiar with tech can still take their next step. And if they need a little bit of extra help, the volunteer is there for that. The second reason this strategy works so well is that even though you have a kiosk set up in the lobby, it's still that same central hub website that everyone else is visiting on their devices. And by doing this, you're able to capture more next steps from everyone of all ages, but they're all using that same website. So you as the leader and staff don't have to worry about some people signing up through email, others using paper signups, others online, and it's all convoluted. You've got to figure it all out on a Monday. Now every next step is happening through your central hub website all in one spot. The final thing I want to point out here is the name of your next steps kiosk. We don't refer to it as the next steps kiosk publicly or in any of our announcements. We call it the lifeabundant.info kiosk. Because again, I wanna ingrain into the mind of my church that every time they need to take a next step, there's only one possible destination and whether they visit that destination on their mobile device or in the kiosk, it's lifeabundant.info, that same central hub website. And there you have it, the two-step church announcement formula. Did you learn something cool in this video? If so, make sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscribe button below. And if you want all of this information in a downloadable PDF, make sure to click the link below this video to get access to this free download so you won't forget anything we talked about in this video. And now I'm gonna turn things over to you. Which part of this two-step formula are you most excited about? Was it the attention-grabbing story framework from step one, or was it the single next step and central hub website from step two? Let me know by leaving your answer in the comments of this YouTube video.